Once upon a time back in August, I began to introduce the College Board's long-winded learning objectives. We started with the big four, usually not in the order the College Board lists them, function, content, context, and form. I think you have those down now. The College Board groups these under the big question, what is art and how is it made? So now I'm going to throw you the other eight learning objections. They're not new. We've been focusing on these objectives all along, but I want to enlist your help in using these objectives to help me guess what it was that made the College Board choose particular works out of so many. The answer is often going to be that a particular work or group of works exemplifies an artistic tradition or that it captures how this tradition changes over time. Think, for example, of how Greek sculpture evolved from archaic to classical to Hellenistic and some of the historical and religious reasons for this shift. We're going to see some similar shifts in the Islamic works. Much of the art we look at in this unit is also shaped by and in turn shaped the art of neighboring cultures. Think of how Buddhist Chinese art reflected the influence of Gandharan art from northern India, yet transformed that tradition in a very different political and cultural context. These last objectives, if they'll come up, there we go, are a bit of a grab bag. Identify is pretty straightforward. That's why we have all those pesky matching quizzes up on Moodle. How formal qualities or content solicit a response, on the other hand, is very open-ended. But I think, for example, of how Buddhist worshipers would respond to the enormous size of the Buddhas in the Bamiyan or Longman Caves. How do worshipers of various religions respond to deep, mysterious passageways or to soaring in well-lit domes? The third objective on this list is all about how our view of art changes as our own cultural context changes. So consider those erotic Hindu sculpture, temple sculptures. Hindu worshipers see an embodiment of Kama, the pursuit of pleasure and fertility that is deemed essential at a particular stage in an individual's life, but only at that stage of life. People from outside of these cultures, well, sometimes they mostly see pornography. The third objective will become more important later in our course when individual artists become better known and are more likely to sign their works. But note that there is one very important architect in this next section whose name we do know and whose work you might very well need to identify, and that is the Ottoman architect Sinan. And finally, we come to compare and contrast. To my mind, this is the best element of the revised curriculum, and we've been looking at comparisons all along. Often the College Board has chosen works, I believe, because they invite comparison. So let's try to smoke these comparisons out. Today we're going to begin looking at four separate mosques. I'll need to finish some of this discussion in my final Islamic art lectures. But let's start our detective work here. Why these four? Specifically, what might each of these four mosques tell us about change over time? About the influence of other works or even other cultures? Do they elicit some kind of special response in their worshipers? Do they invite any particular comparisons? I want you to pause and stop and discuss that for each of these mosques. Well, I hope it was a good discussion. Wish I could hear it. Let me just share a few of my own thoughts, points you've probably already raised. So one of the most fascinating collisions of culture took place in Spain, where Romans were defeated by Visigothic Christians, who were defeated by Muslims, who were defeated by Catholic Christians. The Mesquita tells this story sometimes beautifully, sometimes jarringly. The Persians were innovators. They also married an ancient artistic tradition, the Iwan of imperial Persian architecture, to the mosques of their new religion, Islam. The Ottoman Turks were all about proving that their art was even greater than the art of the people they conquered, the Byzantines. And yet the Byzantines also profoundly influenced Ottoman art. And Jene is, of course, the largest building made of mud in the world and a building that is, its community must essentially rebuild and recreate every year. So before we move on to these specific mosques, remember that you need to be able to identify the more or less universal elements of a mosque from a floor plan or a photo and explain how they relate to the religious obligations of Islam. It would not surprise me if you were given a mosque or a mosque floor plan that was not one of these four required works, but with elements that you'd be expected to recognize. We'll start with the prayer hall. The mosque, which is masjid in Arabic, is above all the Muslim gathering place of prayer. Masjid simply means place of prostration. 
through most of the most of the five daily prayers prescribed in Islam can be can take place anywhere. All men are required to gather together at the mosque for the Friday noon prayer. The main mosque of a city used for the Friday communal prayer is called the Jami Masjid, literally Friday mosque. Here we see the prayer halls of all four of our mosques. Note the two of these, the mosques of Idirne and Isfahan, have open prayer halls, while Jenny and Cordoba have prayer halls broken up by columns. Let's now turn to the mosque at Cordoba, whose prayer hall is probably the most famous at all, at least in the West. And by the way, I should note that Isfahan has columns and part of its prayer hall, but its open Iwan areas uh, are very distinctive. So again, the earliest mosques had hypostyle prayer halls. You've encountered that term before in Egyptian temples, and you see three examples here. The Jenny Mosque is also hypostyle. So what's the big problem with hypostyle rooms? Well, with all those columns, they can feel dark or closed off. So how did the architects of the Mosque of Cordoba solve this problem? They solved them with double horseshoe arches that raised the ceiling, letting in more light and also creating this fascinating geometric rhythm across a prayer, the prayer hall, a rhythm that many people feel inspires prayer and contemplation. The famous alternating red and white voussoirs of the arches are made by alternating layers of brick and stone in the older part of the mosque and with paint in the newer parts. They were inspired, as you can probably see from the painting of the picture on the right, by the voussoirs in the Dome of the Rock. You need to know the term voussoir. As the diagram indicates, these are the stones leading up to the keystone, and that's the stone that holds the arch together. Horseshoe arches had been used on the Iberian Peninsula, that is Spain and Portugal, since late Roman times, but they are now associated especially with Islamic architecture. In fact, arches are so important to Islamic architecture that I'm going to digress just a moment and talk about them. There will be some other digressions like this in this lecture. <clears throat> of course, Islamic architects did not invent the art. As you know, the Romans, and you'll soon see the Byzantines, employed them in many important buildings and expanded their use into barrel vaults, groin vaults, and domes. But the Muslims adapted the arch in ways that I find especially graceful and beautiful. So here's an early version of the horseshoe arch you just saw. You've seen the Mosque of Damascus on your earlier video. And here's a pointed arch that would become so iconic in Muslim architecture. Again, the Muslims didn't invent this either. Architects borrowed these from the Sassanids of pre-Islamic Persia. But they used the pointed arch brilliantly, both for support and for decoration. This is from a mosque in Shiraz, Iran. Crusaders would bring the pointed arch to Europe, where, in a more sharply pointed form, they would play an important role in the architectural revolution so brilliantly represented in Gothic cathedrals. As usual, stay tuned. And speaking of influences across culture and change over time, the mesquita, that's the term, the Spanish term for mosque of Cordoba, is a poster child for works that borrow elements from other cultures and then transform them. The mosque was built on the site of a Visigothic Christian church, which was built on the site of a Roman temple. Indeed, for the first 70 years after the Muslim conquest, Muslims and Christians actually shared the space. They each used half. The Muslim emir then purchased the Christian half, tore down the old church, and built this mosque, which was then renovated uh, over the centuries. We'll see a plan of that in a few minutes. So the emir was eager to show that his new capital rivaled uh, the former Umayyad capital of Damascus. The Umayyads had been kicked out by then, and the new uh, Muslim center in Baghdad. In fact, the emir brought an architect from Syria, uh, to build the mosque at Cordoba. And the mosque at Cordoba does, in fact, bear some resemblance to the great mosque at Damascus. The hypostyle hall of the mosque of Cordoba has 856 columns carved from jasper, onyx, marble, and granite. Some of the columns in the prayer hall, the older part of the prayer hall, came from pieces of the Roman temple, which had occupied the site previously, as well as other destroyed Roman buildings. Some of these columns had stood in the previous Visigothic church. Others, again, were borrowed from elsewhere. It's hard to tell this from the photo, but the columns in the older section are not identical. They're made from different stone, and they have different capitals. Architectural recycling at work. So let's return to our semi-generic mosque plan and consider more elements of the Great Mosque at Cordoba. So first, what do all those dots represent? There are columns indicating that this uh, is a hypostyle mosque, mosque, again, like the Great Mosque at Cordoba. 
So on the right, you see the College Board's required floor plan with another gut diagram on the left uh, that I think makes it clearer. If you're wondering about the church sticking up in the middle, well, we'll get there. And this is the floor plan that shows the change in the Mosque Cathedral of Cordoba over time, including the addition of a Catholic cathedral basically right in the center. Note that one feature of the second enlargement was the construction of a large maksura right next to the mirab for the exclusive use of Umayyad rulers. Not every mosque has a maksura, but many of the most important mosques, especially those in the capital, did. The maksura was a space that was reserved for the ruler or his, or his representatives. Uh, it may have been intended as a separate, safer space where rulers would be uh, protected from assassins. Now, Islam was not a religion that embraced the separation of church and state. Rulers were responsible for maintaining both political order and religious observance and conformity. Nevertheless, there's long been a tension between Muhammad's emphasis on social unity, the equality of believers and responsibility to the poor, and the highly hierarchical society and huge disparities of wealth that arose in most Muslim societies. Of course, Christianity confronted similar contradictions, especially during the same period, which was the European Middle Ages. So here we see the Maksura of Cordoba with a view into the Mirab. Note that the horseshoe arches now have a more elaborate design. These are known as multi-lobed arches. Uh, this wall from the Cordoba Mosque and another College Board required image, by the way, shows horseshoe and multi-lobed arches together. So this photo is taken of the South Iwan of the Ishfahan's Jame or Friday Mosque, which also served as the Maksura, that is, this space did, uh, or the area reserved for the Sultan. This is the largest and most important of the mosque's four Iwans that open out into the courtyard, as is appropriate because it is the Qibla wall, which means facing Mecca. Now, I couldn't find a maksura for our other two mosques. It may be that the sultan who converted to Islam and built the original mosque at Jene in Mali in Africa included a maksura. The rebuilt mosque, the one in your image, however, dates from the early 20th century when Mali was a French colony. Uh, presumably, no maksura was needed for French colonial officials. Uh, at least one book I read indicated that the space in front of the mirab that was traditionally reserved for sultans became, in the Ottoman mosque at Edirne, remember that's our fourth mosque, that open space under the huge central dome. Again, stay tuned. Back to Isfahan. You see those cupped semi-triangular niches? Uh, these are called mukarnas. They developed in Persia, but showed up in the art of North Africa and Islamic Spain as well. They usually are found in domes or even more commonly in half domes. Remember what the term for that is uh, in Roman and soon you'll see in Christian architecture? Those are apses, but that's actually not the term that's used in Islamic architecture. These are referred to as iwans. So here are even more elaborately carved mukarnas, and this is from the Hall of the Sisters from the Nasri dynasty uh, Alhambra Palace in Granada, Spain, and we will get there next lecture, but I want you to see the Mukarnas. So what do those circles in a floor plan represent? Often they're much larger than this. Circles are domes, and in many mosques, even hypostyle mosques, domes are found over the mirab or prayer niche in the Qibla wall, either domes or the half domes or apses. We're going to see large central domes when we look particularly at the Mosque of Adirne. So one interesting note about mirabs, they are always, or we'll say almost always, set in the Qibla wall, that is the wall facing Mecca. But as Islam spread across the world, how did Muslims know where they were in relationship to Mecca? Now, I remember learning in early history classes that Muslim scholars made huge strides in mathematics and navigation. The Arabs were leaders of this in the Middle Ages. And it turns out that the driving force behind many of these discoveries was the search to determine the direction of Mecca. So, wondering where Mecca is from where you're sitting? There are several search engines on the web that help devout Muslims determine the direction they should turn to pray. I typed in the school address, and here you are. So here are mirabs from our other three mosques. I could not find an interior mirab photo for Jene, but the wall within the three towers faces toward Mecca, and there is a mirab below each tower. Note that this also gives you a closer view of the mukarnas surrounding the mirab at Ishfahan. 
So here's the Mirab of the Mosque of Cordoba. Let's watch a short clip from a DVD, and you'll see something surprising about this particular Mirab. Well, now that you've watched the video, what was the surprise? This mosque, or this mirab, I should say, faced not toward Mecca, but toward Damascus. By the way, this mosque was repeatedly remodeled, and I believe a later mirab does, in fact, face toward Mecca. At any rate, uh, the Khan Academy essay assigned for homework gets this wrong, although it's corrected in the notes at the bottom of the article. I just think it's an interesting little tidbit, probably not something that would be on your test. So you saw the image of the Mirab Dome in the video. Note the complex abstract mosaics, which were also including calligraphy. So these were the work of Byzantine mosaic artists whose work was much admired and much hired in the Islamic world. I also want to draw your attention to another feature of Islamic art, abstract repeating geometric patterns or tessellations, often featuring circles or triangles or squares. You see such patterns in the dome over the mirab in the mesquita or the mosque at Cordoba, and also in the example of this Islamic tile that I've included here. So this fascination with geometric patterns seems to have grown both out of the mathematical studies of Arab uh, scholars, but also the limitations created by the requirement that mosque images be aniconic, which means that they contain no zoomorphic figures. Still another characteristic feature of Muslim art and architecture was what is called the arabesque, basically linear patterns of scrolling and interlacing foliage, tendrils, or plain lines. Art historians sometimes refer to flower and plant images as vegetal designs. So here's another example of an arabesque. This is from a mosque in the Central Asian city of Samarkand. Arabesques were commonly intermixed with calligraphy, as you can see here. So... Before we leave Cordoba, where I've already lingered too long, I want to draw, your, draw on your detective skills again. These are two of the College Board's required images of the Mosque at Cordoba. You've seen the rest. So what's going on here? What do these evil geniuses want you to discover by looking at these photos? Cordoba has a cathedral basically jammed into and on top of a mosque. The Christians reconquered Cordoba in the 13th century. In 1236, the mosque was reconsecrated as a cathedral. Mainly, the openings leading from the patio courtyards were closed, and some Christian chapels were inserted. The minaret was also converted into the bell tower you see here. And then in the 16th century, the Holy Roman Emperor and ruler of Spain, Charles V, decided that this mosque church needed to look more like a real church over the objections, interestingly enough, of local Catholics who rather liked their decorative mosque cathedral. He had his architects build a large Gothic Renaissance chancel chapel right in the middle of the old mosque. Charles, who had not seen the mosque beforehand later, regretted his decision, and he apparently reported uh, upon seeing the completed alteration, you have built here what you or anyone might have built anywhere else, but you have destroyed what was unique in the world. Hope he really did say that. So let's watch one more clip from our video, which shows the church within the mosque. So I've talked a lot about the Mosque at Cordoba and a little bit about our other four mosques, focusing particularly on, if you will, generic features of a mosque and how they differ from place to place. Let's pause here and I'll return to finish up mosque architecture uh, in my third lecture on Islamic art.